Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Luis. Um, so once now that everybody has access to the Spanish interpretation channel, um, I will begin by giving a short introduction to Dr. Veronica or Dr. Mm -hmm. Keith. Um, Dr. Veronica Kiefer Lewis is an internationally sought after organizational equity and cultural humility specialist with three decades of experience. She holds certifications as a, as a diversity professional, integral coach, and community and workplace conflict mediator. She brings to her teaching and consulting practice the theories of justice-based leadership, cultural humility, and multicultural education, as well as her practical experience coaching, organizing, facilitating, and teaching. Her focus is on developing cultural humility across the lifespan, peace and equity practice, equity change management, anti-bias education, oppression, oppression transformation, and dialogue healing. So with that, uh, we thank you for your expertise. Dr. V, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for the invitation to join you um, to talk about something that I love so dearly and I'm so passionate about. Let me just check. Can everyone hear me? Okay. If I can just see a thumbs up. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. And I'm just going to do, I'm just scrolling through, looking at all your beautiful faces. So if you are not um, on camera and you feel comfortable to do so just so I can get a peek at everybody and see all of you and say hello and good morning or afternoon. I'm on the West Coast. So I see you. All right, wonderful. So um, we have about three hours together today and lots to cover so i'm going to jump in there will be some activities that you'll have an opportunity to participate in um, there's also a handout with a, a number of different resources in there and some of the materials summarized from this presentation um, this is an introductory workshop so um, if you have never heard of cultural humility i hope that you leave with some good information about uh, what cultural humility means, um, how we begin to apply the four principles, and uh, a deeper sense of what Dr. Melanie Turvalon and Jan Marie Garcia had in mind when they envisioned this concept for application in, in all kinds of fields, um, public health, social service, education, on and on. This really is um, a practice and an approach that you can use in all aspects of your personal and professional life. And I hope you are ex as excited about it as I am by the time we're done. If you are familiar with cultural humility, I hope this is a good review and that, um, you know, take in mind um, or keep in mind how you might want to maybe use some of these activities in your work. I certainly hope that as we go through this journey together over the next three hours, that, you um, you find the activities to be meaningful and that if you have interest in facilitating those activities that you'll take these with you, you'll share them and, and keep the dialogue going. So these are our workshop learning goals for the day um, to define cultural humility. So I'm hoping that everybody feels really confident and comfortable in the distinction between cultural humility and cultural competence and how to explain the four core principles of cultural humility, um, as well as having some opportunity to actually try on cultural humility in our time together. So being able to really reflect Think about how you could bring this work with you in, in, into your practice with clients and with colleagues. Um, and we'll be doing some activities to do a deeper dive around, again, each of the four core components. I will share that there is the chat and the Q&A. Um, and Ainsley's going to be helping me with managing those. So while you can definitely continue engaging with each other and sharing comments in the chat, um, if there are very specific Q&A questions that you have, we're going to make sure that we have some time towards the end of the presentation to just be in dialogue with each other. Um, and that will be an opportunity for me to go back um, with her support to look at those questions and make sure we have a chance to get through those. So 
But right before we get started, sorry yes. on this note, um, I did want to, we very quickly have a, a short pretest. The idea is that we'll be able to see, you know, if um, this, you know, this training is, is helpful for you. Um, these are all questions um, that you'll be exposed to throughout the course of the session, either through, you know, the session itself or the materials provided. And so it's completely anonymous. There's zero pressure. I don't want you to feel any anxiety about this, but um, I launched a, a short pretest um, that, you know, you can just answer that we won't even tell you which one is correct at the moment. Um, but we can kind of go through this at the end if you're interested. So um, if you can take a moment and access that via the polls and we'll just spend one or two minutes. It's just a short five question quiz. Sorry for the for the intrusion. No, no, this is perfect. Thank you. Good way to get us started. Are folks able to see the poll? I wasn't sure. Um, you should have access to it via the poll button. That's at the bottom of your screen if it didn't pop up already. Great. I think some answers trickle in. Great. So I think maybe we'll let folks wrap up on that, but we can maybe go, I'll just leave the poll open and folks can kind of submit that as they're ready and um, we can continue on. So I'll leave that open for now. Oh, you're muted, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. Yeah, I was just taking a quick look at the answers that are coming in. That's great. Very helpful. All right. All right. So this is our agenda for the day. This is in our, we're right now in the welcome and, and grounding component of our agenda. Um, we'll do a little mindfulness moment just to settle in. We'll talk certainly about why that's important. And then we're gonna look a little bit here at the language of cultural humility. So why culture, why humility, why is that what we center in this conversation, in this work, in this approach? Um, share a little bit about the history of cultural humility, introducing you to um, Dr. Trevelon and Jan Murray Garcia, Dr. Murray Garcia. Then we'll look more closely at the principles and in particular the four core um, and do a deeper dive into those. Um, and then think about how you can implement or integrate into your practice. And we'll actually be doing that along the way um, before we wrap up. And again, Ainsley's going to help me with a time uh, check so that we make sure that we get to that Q&A. We don't want to lose time in just being in some dialogue towards the end of our time together. So lots to cover, but um, we're going to go where uh, our, our journey takes us. And so I always like to start with offering community agreements. Um, and this is one of my invitations, and I'll be offering invitations along the way. Again, thinking about not just... Um, how do we talk about cultural humility, but how do we really integrate it into our practice? What are ways, um, strategies that really help us uh, lift up 
um, and leverage cultural humility as a way of being with our colleagues, with our clients, our partners, our, uh, our, our, our participants, whatever language it is that you're using in your various organizations, agency centers, wanting to be inclusive and sensitive to that. So um, I'm not sure what the primary language is that you're using. So some of you may be using partners or participants or clients, but so I'm using that um, to kind of capture all of the folks that you're in service of. Um, and I always like to start with community agreements. Um, and my hope is if this isn't something that you've already established in your agency, that it's something that you think about doing this, this opportunity to think about how is it that we want to do our work in community? What are some of our expectations and goals? Again, part of the, the, overarching commitment and objective of cultural humility is for us to advance equity, to move in the direction of a deeper, more equitized social system, organizational systems. Um, and part of the way that we begin to do that is to make the invisible visible. Uh, because so much of the inequities that we're navigating and are, we're experiencing are about these hidden messages, hidden rules that some folks have access to and that others have to figure out. And so we want to make everything really, really transparent when we're doing culture humility work. And part of that is about us establishing very early on, what are our expectations of one another when we're learning or working in community? Um, and so this is certainly something that you can co-create, that you can generate with your clients, with your colleagues. Uh, it's also something that we can offer and say, this is our starting point um, and inviting others into that with us. And that's certainly how I'd like to begin today, which is to offer these as starting points for how I hope we can hold this space up together collectively as we learn and, and, and move through this journey over the next few hours. Um, and so this is based on a lovely book called The Fourfold Way that looks at um, the author, is an anthropologist, a cultural anthropologist, who really wanted to understand what is it that brings communities together? What are those kind of shared cultural um, dispositions, ways of understanding, ways of being in community? They're shared um, cross-culturally. And what she found, which is really um, situated in deep indigenous wisdom, and I certainly want to use this as an opportunity to also lift up and appreciate the lives, land, and labor that has um, contributed to our ability to be here in these spaces, wherever we are, to honor the original stewards of the land and to know that this is colonized land and it was colonized labor and bodies that um, afforded us this opportunity to be here right now. And there were sacrifices and lots of systems of oppression put in place many, many years ago that um, we're still navigating and we're still un, unlearning and still processing and that still live in our bodies. Um, and so here's an opportunity for us to lift up this deep indigenous wisdom, the way of the teacher, the healer, the visionary um, and the warrior, which the way she articulates this is really to pull this out and say, each one of these roles, these archetypes, if you will, live inside of all of us and we can lean into them and it can help us create a more inclusive, just way of being together as we work and learn and grow. And the first is to show up and choose to be present. Um, and this and I and this is my opportunity to say I appreciate each one of you taking time out of your busy days to come and join um, this workshop, to join this session here online together. And I know emails don't stop, phone calls don't stop. It's all still happening while you're here um, trying to participate in this session. And so if you're feeling yourself being pulled away, I just want to invite you um, when you can in the best way that you can to bring yourself back, your attention back to this to this place to this space where we're learning together, to pay attention to what has heart and meaning for you. And for some of that, it's going to be those things that push your hot buttons and get you really worked up, get your blood pumping, um, that, that doesn't feel right, that doesn't allow, maybe align with your values or worldview. And then there's also those things that get us really energized and excited. And it's important because both of those um, buckets of information, those experiences tell us about who we are and our stories, our places of healing, our places of growth and our strengths. 
And so inviting you to pay attention to that. And I want to encourage you again um, to think about if you're not already doing this, to try on a cultural humility journal, to start writing down. You're going to be getting some prompts as we go through this presentation together, but start to identify what's coming up for you in real time. When are you feeling that you're in your cultural humility? When are you feeling alive and energized? When do you feel like you're in your cultural arrogance? Or when do you feel like a hot button's coming up? Um, to pay attention to those pieces for you. Uh, to tell your truth without blame or judgment, um, without shame or victimization. And this is not just in how we respond to others. This is also about our internal dialogue. Um, and it's really easy, at least I know that it is for me to go to that place of, oh, I should have known that or, oh, I feel so bad there I went and, you know, did it again. There goes that stereotype. There goes that internal dialogue that I'm not good enough or that, you know, oh, I just microaggressed. You know, I'm constantly going through my mind, blaming and judging and assessing myself. And one thing that I want for each of us to do is to know that this is a journey and we are all in different places in our journey and wherever we are is okay, right? As long as we're moving forward. Um, Dr. Turvalon always says we are perfectly imperfect. And so is our journey towards equity. Um, and so as much as we can to release and let go of that place of blame and judgment, because it can immobilize us, it can hold us back from continuing to move forward. And so we tell our truth with a small T um, and we do our best to hear each other. And that's the invitation in this principle. And fourth, to not be attached to the results that we're going to go where we need to go. Um, uh, you know, we, we address the emerging curriculum, whatever comes up, that's where we're going to go, right? That's where we're going to, where we're going to um, continue the conversation. And we may not cover everything and that's okay uh, because we don't know what will emerge in our time together, and we want to be open to that, to that learning and that growth and opportunity. Um, and so we're going to cover as much as we can, and, and we'll see where, where that takes us. How does this sound for pe people? You can certainly use your little emotion um, emojis. I know that, the, is that what it is? The emotional response with smiles and thumbs up, or you can, yeah, there it is. Thank you. <laughs> or you can literally give me a thumbs up if this is working for folks. All right. Is there anything that folks, let me, and you can certainly drop it in the chat. Anything else that you need from the group to fully participate? Any asks or requests of the group? Just checking to see if I see anything here. Oh, and there's, thank you, the resource guide. Perfect. All right. Okay, well, let's, we're going to keep on moving forward then. I'm not seeing any other comments here. Okay. So I'd like for us to really dive in right from the jump with equity. I was talking about cultural humility is a path towards equity. So what is equity all about? How do you understand it? How do you hold it? Um, here's one. I always love this quote here. Seeking equity does not mean taking a slice of someone else's pie, which breeds resentment and aligns with zero sum thinking, but that equity means giving everyone access to essential ingredients and skills to bake their own pie. Right. And so I'm not sure how this is landing for folks, but I want for you to just take a moment. I always like to start with just um, a moment to settle in, settle into our bodies the somatic experience we've been talking about, equity, inclusion, um, systems of oppression, justice, can have can bring up for us a real visceral emotional response because we're talking about our own identities. We're talking about our clients' identities, right? We're talking about our lived experiences as we navigate the world. And that can increase our emotional temperature, right? We can have that fight, fight or flight experience. It's not easy uh, to navigate these systems and to work towards interrupting them and creating something new. Equity is about that transformation, that creating something new. Um, and that takes all of our resources, right? Our deep investment to interrupting sis those systems every day in every way. Um, and so when we think about this work, I often think about cultural humility as a mindfulness practice about slowing down and interrupting the status quo, giving us space 
mindfulness being attention training, right? That we're focusing our attention on this idea of advancing equity. And today we're going to be learning a lot of different things. As I mentioned, it may be some things that are a review, some things that are very new, making different connections, meeting new people, hearing new stories. And I'd love for you to have this opportunity to just kind of take in a deep breath and just settle your system just kind of ground in this moment and think about what is your intention? What is your intention for this time that we have together today? And what is it that you already know and understand about equity that you're bringing into this space? What is it that you know and already understand about cultural humility that you're bringing into this space? And to just sit with that for a moment, let's take another big breath in through a nose and big belly breath out through the mouth, big breath in. And think about what is your intention, your commitment for advancing equity. And one more big breath. And as you're sitting with whatever it is, the intention that you have, your understanding and commitment to equity, I want you to hold on to that and, and have an opportunity. I would like for you um, to move into small groups um, and have an opportunity to introduce yourself to your small group and share with you what brought you here today. What is your hope and expectation for our time together as it pertains to understanding cultural humility and advancing equity? What brought you here today? And a little introdu uh, introduction to a couple of your colleagues. Um, let's see, we're at, so I'm thinking maybe, it, Ainsley, can we do maybe no more than small groups of three or four, just so everyone has, yeah. And we're not gonna do this for very long. So we're gonna do about eight minutes um, and then we'll come on back and keep doing a deeper dive. So this is just an opportunity for you to connect with a couple people who are in the group, share what brought you here today, your commitment or your understanding of, you know, what cultural humility, equity, if, if that feels right, if that's resonating with you. Um, and then we're going to come back and talk a little bit more about equity as part of our context for the day. All right. Welcome back. Welcome back. Okay. So as folks are coming back in, if there's anything that you want to add in the chat about your hopes and expectations or your understanding of equity or cultural humility, you can certainly drop that in the chat. Um, we're going to take a look a little bit more at this concept of equity, because I want to really center cultural humility in that larger picture of that journey of that towards equity, more equitized social systems and organizational systems. So equity is defined as a state of equality or the idea of being just, impartial, and fair. The concept of equity is synonymous with fairness and justice. And this is really what I want to make sure that folks... Um, either we're reviewing this together, or if you're still unclear, that when you hear someone say, um, I'm really committed to equity, which is why I treat everyone the same. Is that in alignment with this idea of equity? Or would you say that's a misunderstanding of equity? How many of you would say that it is an accurate statement to say, I believe in equity, which is why I treat everyone the same? Thumbs up, you're not sure you can do this or thumbs down. That's that's not equity. It's a misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is this is can be a really tricky idea um, that where folks can get really confused about the concept of equity, equity, um, equality. We need a healthy tension between equality and equity and equality uh, really is inherently inequitable because it is about this idea, this lofty idea, if you will, that I'm going to treat everybody exactly the same. And there are certainly places where we want to control 
for bias by trying to hold to this idea of sameness. But we are human beings and we are complex human beings and what we need um, and how we show up for each other and both in the giving and the receiving um, make that sameness component very tricky. Um, equity comes along and says, in fact, we can't treat everyone the same, nor should we treat everyone the same because we're different, complicated human beings. Um, and so how do we meet people where they are and how do we create flexible, agile, fluid enough organizational systems where we can actually meet people where they are at to allow for them to have the experience of fairness and justice, which we all deserve. So the idea of understanding equity within an organizational system asks that we not redefine equity. Lots of organizations will say, well, what does equity mean for our organization and can spend a lot of time talking about the definition. Um, and in fact, sometimes that can even be um, a form of resistance. You know, we'll just talk about it for the next five years and then we don't actually have to do it. Right. <laughs> um, and so the idea is the verdict is in, like we know what equity means. It is about fairness and justice. So the question becomes, how do we operationalize that within our organization? What will it mean to treat each person in the way that they need to be treated so that they can bring their full self to work or that they can have the best experience, the best quality experience possible as a client. Because equity is really looking at the quality of the experience, not the quantifiable like, oh, this individual got the same amount of visits with the counselor as this client over here. It's about the quality of the experience. In those sessions, did they feel seen? Was there a sense of belonging? Were their needs met in a way that would allow them to flourish and grow? Whether that's because harm reduction was applied, motivational interviewing was like, what in terms of equity discernment, what were the tools and strategies I brought to bear? And cultural humility helps us to lean more intentionally into that. What are the ways that I can show up? And how do I operationalize fairness and justice for each individual within my organization so that everyone can have a quality experience? And that's what we're really trying to understand is how do we advance equity? How does cultural humility help us do that? So let's look at it through this, through this um, concept of true community. So some of you may be familiar with Scott Peck's work. He wrote A Different Drum and The Road Less Traveled. Very early on in my career, um, way back in the day, I would have been referred to maybe as a diversity trainer. Some of you familiar with that? Maybe some of you were diversity trainers back in the day. We were, I felt um, loved and hated. And folks were like, no, the diversity trainer is going to come and make us try, cry. And maybe we'll have to sing Kumbaya. Like there was always jokes and no, we don't want that experience. Right. Um, but this was one of those um, uh, approaches, one of these strategies that I was taught very early on 30 years ago in my career, that this idea that when we go into organizational system, we have to understand where they are so that we can begin to figure out what's going to be the, the right intervention or the right approach to help folks continue to move forward in their, in their journey. And over the years, I've equitized this model because um, it does have some parallels to kind of the forming, norming, storming idea of any team. But let's look at this through this through an equity lens. Let's say you're new to your team, you're new to your organization. That's when we kind of find ourselves in pseudo community. And in fact, let's, you're new to your team, you're new to the organization, and everybody loves you. They're just so excited. Welcome to the team. It's going to be so great. We're so glad you're here. You know, usually you hear all the good stuff. You're doing your orientation. People are wanting to meet you. Oh, we should have coffee sometime. I'd love to get to know you. You're probably never going to have a chance to have coffee, but you know, it, it sounds great. It's fun. Anytime you want to get together, let me know. My door is always open. I don't know that I'll be in my office, but it's always open. Come by. And so the pseudo community is where things just feel really good. Everything's smooth. Maybe you're even at the beginning, maybe you've known everybody, but you're joining a new working group or something and people get together and they bring snacks and hell, oh, how was your weekend? And it's all good. And this is pseudo community, pretty superficial. Um, and at some point, if we're together long enough, we show up to the party and maybe somebody says something in one of those meetings that you think to yourself, mm, that didn't sound right. 
that didn't that didn't sound right. I don't think that's in alignment with our organizational values. Um, that felt really uncomfortable for me. But you're not maybe sure if you should say anything in that meeting. Because, you know, here you have to keep meeting with these folks. Do you trust them? Do they trust you? Do you value each other? What's going to happen if I say something that's uncomfortable? Do I have the resources? Am I prepared for a difficult conversation? So oftentimes, you know, folks in those situations say, no, I'm not going to really say anything right now. And they leave that meeting. And maybe what do they do? They go find their homies and they talk about that person. You will not believe what so-and-so just said at that meeting. And so they have these, you know, we have our silos. We have the folks we're really close with. And then we have those folks that we're going to go gossip with and talk about our colleagues or talk about the clients. And can you believe that this happened or that was said or this person handled it this way? And then maybe next week you're back in that meeting with the same folks. Some of those folks that have really pushed your hot buttons in other meetings and we're all playing nice again right? How are you? How was your weekend? Good to see you. All right. And we jump back in that meeting and maybe it's that same one or two folks who say something and you go, oh, that still doesn't sound right. I'm still not comfortable with that, you know? And, and then what do we do? Maybe not say anything in that time, in that space, but go back to our homies, go back to the folks we're closest with, the folks that we feel we can really talk about what's coming up for us, you know, and we talk about them. And we can get caught in this pseudo community to chaos spiral. And my, my invitation to you here is to think about, is this my department? Is this my organization? Where, where am I on this continuum as we go through it? So am I in pseudo community where I don't feel there's like a lot of depth to the relationships? Um, we don't really know each other. We don't know each other's stories. We don't know each other's hot buttons. We don't know how to support each other. Do you feel like you're in this place of chaos? where there's silos, and this is measurable. Like there's this big, dark, heavy red line because it's really hard when an organization gets stuck in pseudo community to chaos to get out of that. And oftentimes what happens in this spiral is there is a low level of value and trust. There is a low level of a felt sense or something you can experience, observe, that you can measure in terms of the degree of fairness and justice, which means there is a low level of equity. The preconditions for equity require there is some level of trust in community because we have to be able to have deep, meaningful, rich, authentic conversations that help us advance this work. And so if the idea is you feel like, oh my goodness, when you describe pseudo community chaos spiral, yes, we have silos. There are people who are burnt out here. I often refer to folks like this, the walking wounded, you know, they're walking around the organization, but they don't want to be there. They've been hurt. They've been beat up. They're done. Or the silent resigners. They're there, but they're not contributing they would like to not be there. You know, they're in meetings surfing their resumes. And so, you know, you know where you are. You might have a sense of where your team is, but this pseudo community to chaos spiral is oftentimes where people say, hey, let's start doing cultural humility work. Um, but we can't do deep, meaningful cultural humility and equity work here. The preconditions aren't right. And um, now cultural humility invites us to get started. That's the, what's so exciting is that if you're here and you're like, but how do we get started? Cultural humility does invite us to get started. The challenge becomes the institutional transformation that we seek when we're talking about equity, because equity really does ask that we look at large systems that we say, hey, what's happening within the system that is disrupting ability for folks to have the same kind of quality of fairness and justice that everyone should be afforded, right? So we can get stuck in this pseudo community chaos spiral. And the goal is to try to get out of that. And emptying is this place where we have rich, meaningful conversations, where we're being reflective. We're thinking about each other. We're thinking about what we need. We're thinking about the voices of our clients. Are they contributing to this dialogue about who we want to be, how we're showing up? So this is about intentional conversations as well. Not just, you know, um, you're walking to the car and someone jumps out and says, hey, you know, can we talk about what you said in that meeting? And you're like, wait, what's going on? Like, can you get on my calendar and we'll have a conversation later? Like, it's not an impromptu, you know, kind of surprise. It's intentional. It's thought out. There's a commitment within the organization that we know having meaningful conversations, even when it's really, really hard matters. It matters to our clients. 
how we show up with each other matters, right? And so there's this knowing in this place of emptying that helps move us towards this deeper sense of community. And this is really where equity thrives, right? Here in this place, in this trajectory, when we're having the, and it's not that it doesn't get hard. It's not that the conversations are easy, but that there's a commitment and an intention. And there has been some training and agreement around the way we're going to be engaged in conversation, right? There's been some training on that about how we're going to engage in deep, meaningful dialogue that helps advance our shared commitment. So we don't have to be best friends, but we do have a commitment that when things get hard, instead of going to our silos, instead of gossiping, instead of, you know, commiserating and then playing nice at the next meeting, that we really care enough about each other and our clients that we're willing to lean into difficult conversations. And that lifts our sense of value and trust for each other. And it increases fairness and trust, I'm sorry, fairness and justice throughout the system. And this is what cultural humility is asking of us to do this journey, to get out of that pseudo community to chaos spiral that often so many of us experience in organizational systems and say, what is the way we can meaningfully connect so that we can do something different and something better? Is this making sense for folks? When you look at this, can you kind of get a sense of where you think you and your organization might be on this trajectory? Some folks, yes. I'm seeing some folks nodding. Okay. I think this is a very cool activity to actually do with teams. I've blown it up like poster size, put it on the wall and had people take, um, different little colored dot stickies and they place them where they think or a sticky pad and place them. Where do you think we are on this trajectory? And when I find, often I find that folks will say they're somewhere in pseudo community to chaos, right? That, that it, they're having a really hard time on some level within their organization of feeling connected and seeing a sense of belonging. And it's important for us to know that it's very hard to offer equity to our clients or to those we're in service of when we're not experiencing it ourselves. And so cultural humility asks us to take a close look at, well, what does this really mean for us? So one thing I wanna encourage you to also do, oh, let me come back. Are there, if you have questions about this, please put it in the Q&A. But here's what I want to say before we transition, which is the cultural humility again is about helping us advance equity. And it does that through the four core principles that we're gonna look at next. And so we understand that there are preconditions that some level of trust and commitment to the process has to exist. And that there is some commitment and understanding that how we talk to each other and that there is an expectation that we are gonna to talk to each other is baked in to this transformative process, right? That we can't do it in isolation or in silos. Um, and when there's healing work that needs to be done, when there's some restoration in the relationships, we take that seriously because we know it has real meaningful impact on the way we can show up and be in service of our clients. And so that's some of what I'm hoping you'll walk away with from looking at this model and this thinking about where are you? Where do you see your own experience in your organization? And how does that impact your ability to be of service to your clients? So thinking about that, reflecting on that as we keep moving forward. Um, in, as a practice of building our equity muscle and being reflective about where we are in that process, I want to invite everyone to think about identifying, if you haven't already, a, a trusted peer that could be your equity partner, a peer support partner around this work specifically to be able to talk about how are things going in my cultural humility journey? Here's what's showing up for me. Here are my challenges, what have you. Um, and so you'll certainly get uh, a copy of this presentation and you'll have some additional instructions around how to identify and engage with an equity partner. But this can be really, really helpful uh, as, we're, as you're deepening your intentional practice of cultural humility. So again, having an equity peer partner, someone that you can talk to, reflect with, and the idea really is to listen and see each other and ask critical and um, reflective questions of each other. How, how are you doing? How are you showing up? Right. 
So with that in mind, thinking about how equity plays out in our organization, that there is a prerequisite for doing deep equity, meaningful work, equity being that that is about fairness and justice within a system. How do we understand and how do we operationalize fairness and justice in each of your systems that will look and feel different? But the idea is we want to make sure everyone's having a solid quality experience. And how do we begin to do that? Cultural humility is a path towards equity. And so why culture? Why are we talking about culture? And I'd love for you to have an opportunity to really think about your own cultural identities. How do you personally identify? When you think about your own cultural identities, how would you describe your cultural background? And some folks may be asking, why are we talking about culture versus race? And it's not that we don't talk about all of those dynamics of race and gender and orientation and socioeconomic status, immigration status, language status, health status, family status, all of those dynamics and components are important and they're all cultural because they are socially constructed. So if it's socially constructed, meaning we as human beings give it meaning and it changes over time and in social location, it's a cultural dynamic. And so that's what we want to understand is how do those cultural dynamics, those identities shape our worldview? How do they help us understand who we are in relationship to other people? How do we make judgments around that? When are we um, saying this is right, this is wrong, this is good, this is bad? All of that is shaped by our cultural worldviews, our understanding of who we are. And in any social location that gets activated. And so we want to be able to think about culture in this very broad, expanded way and thinking about it also intersectionally, understanding that all those aspects of our identities come with cultural messages about what is right and wrong and good and bad. What does all that mean? And it shows up for us when we're not thinking about it, right? We often get these messages when we're very, very young. And they live with us in our bodies and they shape the way we see the world. I'd like to share a story with you. This happened um, shortly after 9-11. And I was working with a, a, a group of child care providers who all had centers. And... And in this session, it was a family-friendly event. So the session direct the this the um, center directors and and various teachers were in this space, and they could bring with them their children. And after the presentation, which was on serving multiracial, multi-ethnic families, um, there was a pre- one of the practitioners came up, and she's holding a child's hand. Um, I identified her, um, again, this was my, she did not share her identity with me. This is what I saw. I saw her, um, and I identified her as a white identified woman. She had a blonde hair, um, and very lovely person saying all the quote unquote, right things. I'm very concerned. We have a very large Afghani population. I'm very concerned about how they may be experiencing, um, the effects of 9-11, what that will mean in terms of possible hate crimes. I really want to know how I can, you know, wrap my arms around our community and make sure folks are feeling safe. And while she's talking, the director of the training um, organization they had, that had invited me in to do this, this um, session, who is an Afghani identified man, walks up um, behind me. He, he's walking towards us to, to, I imagine, say hello and part, be part of the conversation. And in that moment, she took the child's hand and pulled the child behind her. And so you could see her disposition change, her body tensed up, and she pulled the child behind her. Now, I don't know if she knew he was Afghani identified. I don't know how she identified him. Um, but this is, was a cis gendered identified male, um, man of color, an Afghani identified man, 
who when he joined our conversation, you could see that she was visibly uncomfortable. And her nonverbal behavior spoke much more loudly to that child than anything she might have said in real time. She pulled the child behind her. And I want you to reflect on that moment. When in your own experience, as small children, did you hear an adult or a trusted uh, you know, adult person in your life say something that resonated deeply, maybe as a child about justice and fairness. We want to treat people equally. We love all people. And yet the behavior you saw shared a very different message around fear, around discomfort, around lack of safety. I don't know if that was about a discomfort around maleness, a lack of familiarity, if that was around race, if that was around his height. I don't know what has had what her past triggers or pains or hurts might have been. I don't know any of that. I don't know though that she either shared any of that with her child. But the child is left to make up a narrative, a story about that moment. And each one of us in our lives have had those moments as young people where we hear and see and experience things that are inconsistent. And that begins to shape a story about the world around us. Maybe you got into an elevator and heard an adult that you were with, you know, someone came into that elevator or was going by you on the street in a wheelchair. And as a child, you said, what's that? And they said, don't stare, don't point. Did you ever have those moments? Don't stare, don't point, right? Don't ask questions. As a small child, we're left to make up them the information, to create a narrative, often about that must be bad, that must be wrong, difference is bad as wrong, right? Those kinds of stories begin to shape our worldview. They become then baked into our system and reinforced by media, by school, by peers, by community. And cultural humility says those narratives and our storied identities matter. They shape how we then move through the world. And we have to begin to excavate, excavate them. We have to dig in deep and say, hey, where did that come from? What experience told me that this was wrong or this was bad or this was unsafe? Is that rooted in a truth and an experience that I've had? Can I be open to a different way of knowing and understanding? So it's about that getting really curious about our own stories and about our own cultural identities. Is this making sense for folks? Okay. And so here, what identity groups do you belong to? I'd like for you to have an opportunity to just do a free write. Just take a couple 60 seconds to just write. Think about all, these are all identity groups and we got cultural messages around all of them, around our gender expression, around our profession expression, around our education, around where we grew up, all those things come with cultural messages. Um, and I would like for you to just write down a quick free write around all the cultural identities, the ways you identify, all the ways you identify. And there's no right or wrong answer to all you. And so we're going to go back in to the small breakout group. And I would love for you, if you're comfortable and you always have choice, so you certainly don't have to go into group if you would prefer to just write and reflect. Um, and when you're in group, you have the choice to share as much or as little as you like. And what you share, I really want for each one of us to respect and honor the confidentiality of that sharing. So if we come back to the larger group and there's something that you want to share with the larger group, I invite you to hold on to just your personal story and sharing, right? If there's something that you hear from someone in your small group that you think would be really powerful to share with a client or with a colleague to, to message them or to ask in real time for permission, I'd love to share your story. Would um, you be okay with that? And, and if so, how could I share that story 
um, in a way that feels comfortable with you for you. So there may need to be some negotiation, like you can share, but don't say my name or my organization. So be in conversation with each other if you're inspired and moved. Um, but let's take about, um, we're going to do another eight minutes and we'll do small group uh, for you to just share a little bit about your cultural identity, your cultural background. Um, and if you have time or one of these other questions resonate for you, how does your cultural identity shape your work? How, how is it showing up for you in your philosophy? And then we're going to come back um, and look at the four core principles of cultural humility. Um, Welcome back, everyone. All right. Welcome back. Welcome back. Show of thumbs. How was that? Or clap or a heart? How was that for folks? Yeah. How many of you enjoyed being in conversation? Good. Good. It's so important, so important. So I'm not sure how often you get to have these kinds of conversations when you're at work and you're um, with your colleagues, but we definitely want to encourage more of these kinds of conversations uh, to be able to talk and share with each other. Like, this is my background. This is my worldview. This is how um, I'm thinking about my work um, or things that I'm unfamiliar with, I'm uncomfortable with. How do I make sense of that? Can we talk and be in partnership with each other? Um, and to be able to create working teams where cultural humility really is the orientation to each other's learning and growth and, and service. Um, and so being able to really be clear on who am I, what is my story, what is my experience, how does it shape the way that I'm working with other folks is really fundamental to our cultural humility work. So let's, you, you've had this experience now of thinking about community agreements. How do we all get to, to know the sense of commitment that we have for our work together? thinking about the trajectory, culture, humility, moving us in this path, in this direction towards equity, moving us towards deeper trust and value, expanding um, the quality of an experience that folks are having when they come to our agencies, deepening justice, deepening fairness. And then thinking about culture being all of this vastness that we all share and have in common, we have the complexity of our stories, our past experiences, narratives um, that we live into and shape who we are. So we take this as a foundation. And then you have Melanie and Jan who enter and say, and there's so much more. But knowing who we are is part and parcel for being the best service providers we can be. And so let's take a look at that that idea, these four core principles that help connect everything together. There's this lovely quote um, that cultural humility is not a discrete end point. This is by Leland Brown, but a commitment and active engagement in a lifelong process that individuals enter into on in an ongoing basis with those that they're in service of. That every time we're in a new relationship, all of our cultural identities are activated. They're alive in that moment. We're figuring out who we are as we're figuring out who someone else is and the ways in which we create a new experience in each of those interactions. And how do we always stay open to that? Where the learning and the growth and the stretching can, can really um, allow us to meet folks where they are at, right? That humility, that taking a step back and saying, I, I don't know everything, um, but what I do know is who I am in this moment and how I'm showing up. And that's what I have control over. So I always like to introduce um, Dr. Melanie Chervalon and Dr. Jan Garcia, who are the co-visionaries and creators of this framework. I am um, very dear friends with Melanie, who is both, uh, Melanie is a colleague, a mentor, um, 
my dissertation research was the first of its kind to really empirically look at how do we develop cultural humility across the lifespan? Um, and how do we begin to understand how to help practitioners develop more intentionally their skills and abilities for cultivating culture and humility? Um, I'm gonna show you this really lovely clip from a video that's about 30 minutes that I do hope that you'll watch the full video and that you'll watch it with your colleagues, that you'll share it in your agencies by Vivian Chavez that is um, about called Principles um, and Practices of Cultural Humility. And it tells more of the breadth and depth of the history that brought them to this work. But what I will share briefly is that they were inspired after the Rodney King beating by the police and the violence that they were witnessing. They were both pediatricians at this time in Oakland at Children's Hospital. Um, and they were seeing what was happening on a national stage play out and realizing um, as they had known in their work that what is happening in terms of systems of oppression at this larger social level they're not separate from the work that they were doing with clients, that the ways in which communities are impacted in their day-to-day -day life, whether it's through police um, violence, state section violence, racism, sexism, heterosexism, homophobia, the ways in which we move through the world, um, language bias, class bias, all of those different dynamics, and that can go on and on and on, impact our real lived experiences every day. And when clients were showing up in their office for support and help, that was also being projected onto both of them as black identified women, as doctors, as folks with positional power, but not always identity power. Um, and those experiences mattered and they shaped the way they were able to support their clients. And they understood that no matter how much we quote unquote learn about a cultural group, what happens in real time, we don't know. We can't anticipate that, but we can be committed to how we want to show up and working to create the conditions for someone to be able to open up to the experience in a new and different way. And no amount of information we learn in a workshop can create that. It is about a human experience, about my open heart about my willingness to learn and be humble. And that really was the inspiration, was knowing that systems of oppression are working all the time and the trauma and the impact that our clients experience out in the world comes into our interactions with us as service providers. And what can we do? How can we prepare ourselves more fully for that? And that is how they came up with these principles. I'm going to show you the opening. It does only talk about the three principles at the time, which we've since pulled out into four. And we'll look at those more closely. But let me introduce, I think it's so important to bring them into the space and honor their amazing work. So let me see if I can pull up this video. We can't hear it here. I think you might have to share your audio too. Oh, okay. Let's see. What when you I... when you go to click screen share, there's a little box at the bottom that you have to check to share audio. Here, okay. Do you Can see you it? still hear me okay right now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Let me see if I can do that. Um, share audio. Hmm. Cultural humility, the whole concepts yep. of cultural yep. humility. Um, Great, thank you. To describe cultural humility for me is is love, actually. If I had to encapsulate cultural humility, the whole concepts of cultural humility. Um, it doesn't do it justice, but the word that I think of it that is essence. It's a good chapter. Being. You. Opening. Receive. Compassion. Love. The principles of cultural humility offer one more framework to contribute to what has got to be our ultimate goal. Yes. Our ultimate goal is that there will be a sense of 
equity, a sense of equality, and uh, a kind of and, and a kind of respect that we are driving forward. Cultural humility that is a, is a multi-dimensional concept, and and certainly, um, Melanie Tervalon and I um, conceptualized three dimensions. The first is lifelong learning and critical self-reflection, and in that critical self-reflection, it is the understanding of how each of us. Every single one of us is a complicated, multidimensional human being. Each of us comes with our own histories and stories, our heritage, our point of view. You're looking at me now. I am very fair skin. When I was a little girl, my hair was blonde. My eyes are blue. People often try to call me anything but African American. I have a history. My identity is rooted in that history. My parents gave me the knowledge of my own social identity and my own experience in life is created that. I get to say who I am. The second tenet uh, after uh, self-reflection and ongoing lifelong learning and development is, is this notion that we must mitigate the power imbalances to recognize and mitigate the power imbalances that are inherent often in our clinician, um, patient or clinician client or um, service provider community dynamics. And then finally, the, the piece that I would offer that Jan and I feel people often either don't read or don't like which is, and the institution has to model these principles as well. All right. So let's let's look a little bit more at these. One word to just. Where did it just go? There it is. Can you still see it? Yes. Good. All right. So cultural humility. And so, as I mentioned, there is a principle that we pulled out so that there are now four instead of three, as mentioned in the video. And so the four core principles include this number one, the principle, the first principle, which is all about lifelong learning, self-evaluation, and what I like to refer to as compassionate self-critique compassionate self-critique. And this is at the intrapersonal level. So at the intrapersonal domain, which is the foundation for all of our culture humility work, who am I? What is my story? How am I showing up in the world? It's all about the self-reflection. And for my visual learners, I always like to use the visual of the mirror. And I'm in my cultural humility when the mirror is facing inward, that I'm looking back at my own reflection and I'm asking the question, why did I just show up like that? Why did that just push my hot button? Maybe you've had those moments where someone says something and you're just like, Arr! and you just immediately just feel prickly or it makes your, your hot button, pushes a hot button for you um, or whatever the case might be. And the question would become, why did that just trigger me like that? Why did I just get activated? Or why is it that when that person talks, I feel so frustrated or impatient that we ask ourselves those questions first before the cultural arrogance 
right? The cultural arrogance is when the mirror is facing outwards and it becomes a you, 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 you're the problem. It's your perspective. That's the issue. If you just wouldn't have blah, blah, blah. I know that you were hired purposely to ruin my life. I'm sure it's in your scope of work that you were here to make me miserable. Instead of going there, that we're starting first with the mirror facing inward. And we're taking personal account and responsibility for what's showing up for us. It doesn't mean that that person hasn't hurt us, that they haven't microaggressed upon us, that they, that there hasn't been a really um, uncomfortable interaction. It means that we first start with, why was that a com uncomfortable interaction for me? What do I have to learn here? What is the healing that I need to be responsible for? What is my role in this interaction that I need to be accountable for? And just being reflective in that space. So again, we start with the mirror facing in. And the interpersonal level, principle number two, is all about our relationships, that mutual respect and beneficial partnerships. Not that it's about power over. Remember, Melanie and Jan were really... Um, it was really important as we were, they were thinking through this concept that the idea is that when we come with positional power into an interaction, and if you're a service provider meeting with a client, you have power, you have access to information and resources that that person is coming to you for help with. And so it's very easy to find ourselves in a power over dynamic. And the idea is how can it be power with that we are partners in this process that you as an individual, while you are coming here for services, you have deep wisdom. You know what you need. You are wise and I can learn with and from you. And how do we structure a relationship that's power with, that's mutually beneficial, that we can be in our humble, um, we can be in our humble space and still be able to say, I can be of service and support, right? And so it's not about making one person more important, it's about understanding we have different responsibilities and roles. And it's not about saying that someone is smarter um, or more knowledgeable and has more power, power over versus power with. We are both wise. And can we hold each other as wise teachers? And the third principle is what is happening at the cultural level in terms of understanding that power exists. Institutions are exquisitely designed to produce the outcomes they produce and to replicate themselves. De institutions are designed to produce inequities. They are designed to be of service of some folks and uh, more so than others by design, by design. And we inherit those institutions when we, when we step into them. And so part of our work in terms of dismantling and interrupting systems of inequity is to figure out who does the organization serve better and others less well, and how do we interrupt that? And so we have to understand power. How is power at play in our interpersonal relationships, but also at the institutional level? Who's receiving more services? How are they receiving services? You know, um, we have one interpreter for. 50 clients, we have one service provider who shares an identity with all of these clients, whatever the case might be, what's going on here? Do we have equity parity? Do we have resources to really serve and support everyone in the way they deserve to be served and supported as we're advertising at our agency? You know, that we ask those difficult questions, that we get really, really, um, honest with ourselves at the institutional and individual level about the way power and privilege is impacting our interactions and our ability to be of service. And that leads us into number four, as Melanie said, the hardest one is that the system has to do this. It's not enough for us as practitioners to be self-reflective, to be leaning into our humility, to wanting to really support our clients. We need to know that the institution is doing the same thing the institution is being reflective, that they're getting involved in really understanding how they, they can do better service and support work, not just for clients, but for the employees as well. See, the employees are the clients of the organization and they deserve to experience equity because it's really hard to give clients something that we as employees aren't experiencing, right? So the employees of the organization have to receive the benefits and the quality of equity as well and experience cultural humility in practice. So these are the four principles. 
first principle being about introspection, lifelong learning, self-evaluation. The second being about mutually respectful and beneficial partnerships, leaning into our culture of humility to have power with, understanding power imbalances, principle number three, and that the institution has to maintain consistency. In other words, engaging in steps one, two, and three as well. All right, if you have questions, please go ahead and put those in the Q&A box. We're gonna come back to those definitely, but let's do, let's keep moving. There are skills that we can develop. So much of my research has been looking at what are the skills that we can cultivate, skills and abilities, if you will, actually, it's a bit of both, that help us to deepen our cultural humility. And one is around our ability to be in dialogue versus discussion. This place of non-judgmental, opening, curious, listening, empathetic engagement. Excuse me. Where discussion, coming from the word percussion, it's about breaking things apart separating, being in debate, pushing an agenda versus being open and being um, influenced and being open to being influenced by someone else's perspective, their needs, their ways of knowing and moving through the world. The other is around self-reflection and critique, our ability to do a deep dive, not just kind of thinking about as we're on our way home from work, hey, what happened today, but a different level of self-reflection and critique, asking ourselves a different level of um really through this kind of mindfulness perspective, this attention training, refining our equity lens, our cultural humility lens, so we can ask, how did I show up and why? Where did that come from for me? What story was I telling myself? What story was I making up about this other person? What story was I creating about this interaction? Right, And maybe you've had those moments where you're sure this person, I just had this experience a couple of weeks ago with a colleague who we had gone through a training and I was sure that maybe I had said something to offend them. And I was really worried, checking in, reaching out to check in. And then when they didn't respond, I thought, oh, I definitely, I think I must've put my foot in my mouth. I, you know, this must've been an oops or an ouch moment. Um, I just feel really bad, you know? And then when they did respond, they said, oh, I was just really busy working on blah, blah, blah. But I had created this whole story that I had offended them, that I'm sure, you know, we were, I disrupted um, our working relationship and feeling really sad. I feel like I'd already started the grief process. Like, oh, I feel so bad about having hurt them. And they're like, I was just busy. You know, I had all these other things I had to do. I was having a bad day and I was running around and I was just feeling like, oh my goodness, here I made up all this story and then contributed all these emotional, mental, you know, psychological resources into running with this story. And I hadn't had a time to really check it out and process. And that's what we need to be able to do because we do create stories about to make sense of our interactions. And so this self-reflection and critique is about, yes, doing the deep reflective work about what did I do? How did I show up? How might have I hurt someone unintentionally? What amends needs to be made? Is there any circling back that needs to be made? But also staying actively curious. Am I making up a story? How am I showing up with this other person? How am I showing up for self? And this is can lead us into this opportunity for transformational conflict, that when things get difficult, we talk about it, but it moves us forward in the direction of equity versus retreating into pseudo community and chaos. So we learn the skills of being in difficult conversation. In the same way, we learn about the skills of identity negotiation. Who am I in this moment? Not that I'm being someone that I'm not. Not that I'm being inauthentic, but that I have a knowing that there are certain identities that come forward um, into the foreground, if you will, depending on my interaction with whom, right? And what does that mean? How do we assess that for power and privilege and connection and disconnection? And that leads us into this idea of getting really curious, being in a place of deep, curious listening and practicing that skill. So these are skills. All of these five are skills we can cultivate that help us deepen our cultural humility over time. And we're going to look at a couple of these as we think about the four core principles. Let me see. I'm not seeing any questions so far. Okay. 
So let's take a step back and just make sure I'd mentioned a little bit about the story that Dr. Turvalon and Murray Garcia shared um, in terms of cultural humility and cultural competence uh, around the kind of this is a, a strategy or a response to cultural competence. And here you can see in the slide, there's this distinction that we're making between cultural competence and cultural humility. And some of you might be quite familiar with the language of cultural competence. And kind of the biggest sticking point um, is that cultural competence can assume an end point that we're going to go to a workshop or we're going to go to a session and we're going to learn all about community A. And then we'll know enough to meet their needs when they arrive at our agency. If we just have this kind of bucket of information. And certainly we can talk about cultural patterns as a starting point. We see this in this community. I'm a biracial black queer woman. Maybe someone goes to a workshop to learn about biracial black queer women. And then they meet me and they're like, but you're nothing like what I learned in the workshop. I thought you'd want this and I thought you'd want that. And I should, you know, have my rainbow flag shirt on. And like, I don't know, whatever the case might be. And this is the complexity that cultural humility attends to. It says, yes, you can go to a workshop and learn all about a community. And then you can go and meet someone from that community who says, none of that applies to me. Or it's very different for me. Or the way I show up in my identity looks and feels very different from what you learned. But what do you know about yourself? Can you be comfortable in that discomfort? Can you be open to saying, well, then in real time, I'd love to know more about your cultural identity. But how can I understand more deeply who you are so that I can meet and support your needs? So that there's never an end point, that we don't get boxed in and then run the risk of um, stereotyping, which is an end point, that this is how it is for all groups. So we want to distinguish between cultural patterns as a starting point and stereotypes as an ending point. And cultural humility says we can understand those starting points, but we need to be comfortable enough to be open to getting curious and asking those questions and figuring out well, how can I be of service to you in real time? Power with. Oops. So the last piece here that I want to discuss before we're going to do a little bit of a deeper dive into each of the principles, but I would like for you to have an opportunity to also think with me for a minute about this concept of humility, which for some folks, it can be a real stumbling block um, because maybe their uh, association with humility is like, um, I'm going to be self-loathing or, um, you know, someone's going to be justified in humiliating me or making me feel small or less than. And that is not how we're using this word in the cultural humility framework. It really is this idea of staying teachable, of staying open, of being patient with ourselves, of being gentle with ourselves and with each other and saying, I can hold the complexity that is my story and your story that we can be different and still inhabit this space and support each other and learn from each other and grow, right? And so there's, I bolded here where it says, you know, that in Melanie's original, her, Melanie and Jan's original article, Dr. Um, Turvalon and Murray Garcia talk about, you know, this really is about curbing the individual's drive towards always needing to feel like they're right and that they know everything. Again, removing this pressure of expert that, I can know what I know and I can bring a lot to this relationship, but what I can never know is fully who you are and the wisdom you bring unless you share with me. What are your needs? What are your gifts? What are the ways in which you're going to be showing up around your own support resources and how do I contribute and help facilitate and complement that, that we're in partnership versus you're coming to me and I know what's best for you. And so it really is trying to uh, mitigate the impact of that power over dynamic and this notion, which is so important in U.S. culture, that I'm the expert, I'm the all-knowing, I know what is right, and I have the truth with a capital T. It really is very counterculture in that way, which is what makes it so exciting and um, transformative, right? That it's saying, hey, we are individuals, we are complex human beings trying to figure this out together. How can we do that? And there's something really beautiful, I hope, that you're holding on to about that. And what a relief 
right? To be able to say, while I know all the good things that I know, and I have this experience to share, I'm still learning and growing. I'm going to make mistakes. Can we be patient and kind to each other as we're doing that? How do we figure that out together? So I'd like for you with all that I've just shared to have an opportunity to go back into your groups and um, talk a little bit about, so what is your understanding right now of cultural humility? How are you understanding cultural humility? Again, the four core principles. The first one, see if you can remember what it was. It's all about the intrapersonal domain, self-reflection, compassionate self-critique and lifelong learning. How am I showing up? The mirror facing inwards. Who am I? Principle number two. Think about it for a moment. It's all about the interpersonal domain. That's about mutual respect and partnership, being interconnected, um, really lifting up and seeing the value in each other and the gifts you're bringing to the interaction. Number three, principle number three all about the cultural domain and specifically we focus on understanding power and privilege dynamics how does that shape our interactions again understanding that positional power in an organization is always trumped by identity power so there are some identities that are more privileged in our society and those that affords people more power and access and we're trying to mitigate that difference trying to understand how to create power with, right? Voice, access, opportunity. And then principle number four, institutional consistency. The institution has to do one, two, and three as well. So those are the four principles. How are you understanding cultural humility right now? How are you making sense of all this? Let's do um, another, we'll do just a, a pair share. Can we do pairs? Um, and we'll do just about five, let's do six minutes. So each person has about three minutes to just kind of talk about, take it off the top. What's coming up for you as you're hearing this? What is your understanding of culture and humility? So welcome back everyone. So any questions or comments before we do um, our review? I'm just checking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would okay, just, sorry, sorry. I would just like if when we go into these breakout rooms, that we get a longer notice than one minute <laughs> to to get out. Like right now, my partner was talking and all of a sudden it's like, boom. Got it. Uh, I'll send a, I'll send like a, a it just feels like sometimes warning. Right, because there is not enough okay. time to like wrap it up. Thanks. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I'll do that for the next one. Thank you. All right. I know this time goes so fast that it's it's hard to get it all get it all in there. We're moving kind of quickly, so thank you. So see Cecilia has a hand. Okay, thank you. Um. Yes, my question is about the principle number one. Mm -hmm. People like me who is coming for, uh, for, from a culture that they are always, uh, I'm gonna attack by myself that my mom or my family culture is to serve, 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 serve. Never asking for help or never asking and I have a struggle criticizing myself. I have a struggle saying, you know what? I don't think that you deserve to be in this position. I think you are not um, prepared enough. Oh, you are a bad person. That's as what I feel like, oh my gosh, I struggle with that. And how are I to change that in order to see myself, the qualities? Oh, I don't know how to say, just, just be aware that sometimes what we are talking and and when we have some activities and say say something good about or mention something that is good about yourself, some strength, it's really hard for me to find something. Mm -hmm. I am good saying others people strengths, but not about me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you so much, Cecilia, for sharing. Um, I think that takes a lot of courage to be able to say something like that in a big open forum like that. So I just, I want to first just really appreciate you. And I don't think that you're alone in, in that feeling that one of the hardest things um, that I think a lot of us, myself included, definitely is the imposter complex. I'm not good enough. I'm not ready enough. I haven't had enough experience. I haven't had enough education. I know I'm so always beating myself up. Should I really be doing this work? Blah, blah, blah. Um, and then also just the full self-love. Like, yeah, you know, this is the thing that's so great about cultural humility is it reminds us that we're never going to know enough. We're never, it, we're, cause we're, it's never a place of arrival. So we do the very best that we can with what we have and know that that is a gift that you're showing up is a gift. And so I just really want to encourage you start that cultural humility journal. And I would love to have you um, every day, write down three gifts, three gifts that you're bringing to the day. I am bringing love. I am bringing joy. I bring laughter, whatever it might be. But I really want to encourage everyone to try that activity on is to identify what are the three things, the three gifts and they can, and I want them to be different every day. What are the three gifts that you're bringing so that you can really, again, looking in that mirror and fully seeing who you are and the gifts that you're bringing and knowing that when that tape, that um, self-destructive, I'm not good enough, I'm not ready, um, I don't have the skills, when that tape starts playing to be able to learn how to push pause. And to be able to say, I am ready. I'm never going to know everything. And that's okay. I am going to make mistakes. That's part of the journey. And that's okay. And I'm ready to do this good work. And I think that we have to all be doing that for each other as well. Because again, we're living into our storied identities. And somewhere, whether it's a larger cultural system, our family systems, school systems, whatever the system is, we've received those messages, right? Many of us have received those messages that we're not good enough. We're not smart enough. We're not privileged enough or whatever it is. It's not enough. And we have to be able to support each other through micro affirmations and create spaces of micro healing. And so what does that mean? Again, just as we're doing this work at the individual level, it's important for us to be doing it collectively. So the collective self-care is to be able to appreciate each other, to be able to see each other, right? I, I hope, Cecilia, that I don't know if you have colleagues in this space, but I would love for your colleagues to also be able to see you and be able to say, what you just did was amazing. When you did this, that really had an impact on the client and give you an opportunity to really take that in. So we can do this for ourselves and each other. Right. And that's what happens as we're working through micro affirmations. Roe, I believe it was at 2012 out of MIT, did some really great research looking at micro messages, messages of inequity and messages of affirmation. And when we receive those messages, those micro affirmations from our colleagues, from our peers, it creates opportunities for healing, to be able to fully see ourselves, to see our gifts through someone else's eyes. And that allows for us to do collectively better. So self-care is both an individual experience and a collective experience. And so really inviting you to be gentle with yourself, to take time every day to reflect on the gifts that you're bringing, all of the strengths and gifts that you have, to write those down, you know, post affirmations around your room, your office, your car, wherever you, you know you have space to be reflecting back your words of affirmation and to think about how we can offer that to each other, to offer that to each other, those gifts of micro affirmations, which create micro healings. That is the hard work of principle number one is who am I? And to be able to do this deep dive into thinking about our own history, our experiences, our worldview, you know, to be able to think about 
where is my negative self-talk coming from? Why is it that I continue to feel this imposter complex? What is happening? Is that is that my stuff or am I inheriting that from the system around me? I know when I was a little girl and I think that I might've been in second grade, my teacher pulled my mom in and said, I really want to talk to you about Veronica. You know, she's really not doing very good in second, you know, here in, in second grade. Um, she's spending a lot of time talking and she prioritizing snack and nap. Granted, I was in second grade and I, I, I'm not going to, I am not mad that I was prioritizing snack and nap. Those were important things, right? But she said to my mom at that time, I don't think she's cut out for school. I was in the second grade. Um, and someone had already decided my future educational path was a wrap. And this is not uncommon. I mean, the prison to school, the school to prison pipeline is usually determined by things that happen up and around third grade. That's the pain and the irony is that there is something that does as a system happen for young children in their elementary school years that predicts their scholastic journey how people see them, how they invest in them, how they begin to say a story and tell a story that young people then live into. And fortunately, I had a mom who had the resources and the opportunity and education, educational privilege to say, I'm going to pull and the financial means to pull me out of that school and put me somewhere else. But that was a story that the adults in that community that I would hear as I grew up would chuckle about and can you believe that you know your second grade teacher but there was deep pain and I worked really really hard to try to overcome that narrative that I wasn't cut out for school from people in my community and this was so in deeply ingrained in me that when I went to college it was important that I got a 4.0 it was important that I got a doctorate it was important that I had all this education because I needed to prove that I was smart, that I was okay, that I was worthy of love by this community. That's really hard and painful. And we get those messages really early on. So again, we have to dig deep, that honest self-reflection. Who am I? My social and cultural identity. What are the narratives that I'm getting from the folks around me about my worth? And when those messages become our own, we have to be able to say, that's not my stuff. That was somebody else's stuff. And that begins a healing process, right? And so this deep self-reflection, it encourages a constant wave of self-awareness about who we are, how we're showing up, our areas of growth, our areas of healing, and our strengths. And that knowing, I want to just reiterate this, especially in light of the very powerful sharing that we had, self-reflection is something that we all do naturally. It often happens at an unconscious or subconscious level. So we need to pull it to our conscious awareness, which is the invitation in principle one. And then we need to know that we're only holding part of the story, right? So what you see is not actually the full reflection. It's not actually the full truth and reality. It's our snapshot in time. And so we have to be able to navigate and say, okay, what is my negative self-talk? Where's my truth? What was my pain? What's my area of growth? What's my strength? How do I take this information and move forward? And this is the kind of level of self-reflection we're inviting folks to do. And so let's look at this. Self-reflection is an executive functioning. So it is something that we have a, an, an innate ability to do. And we want to refine that. The way we do that is by attention training, more mindfulness, more slowing down, writing and recording our thoughts. And then looking back over those, is that really what happened? Is that really how I'm feeling? Am I really not, do I really not have the ability to lean into this work? Am I really not prepared? What do I need? Where is that coming from? So asking ourselves those kind of deep critical reflection questions. And it can be an ouch. It's not, these aren't easy questions. It says here, it can be ego bruising, right? But we want to be able to understand where we're stumbling, where we can continue to do this work in a deeper, more meaningful way that allows us to serve our clients better. Right. So we want to model. Um, so we want to lead by example and doing our own self-reflective work and then inviting others in to do it with us is very powerful, especially if we're leading by example. Right. 
So it is very easy to go to self-criticism, but it can be something that increases our awareness and, and then really ensuring our personal growth. So it's how we hold any of our information up to the light. And so I want you to always do that with curiosity. Huh, I just told myself that story. Where did that come from? And get curious about it versus just immediately believing it. I just told myself that I am I am not good at this. I, I do not know what I'm doing. Okay, where did that just come from? Versus, yep, that's right. That's the truth. So to get curious um, and, to, and to really reflect on the harm that we can do to ourselves, how do we open that up for possibilities, right? That this is an opportunity for growth and learning versus kind of shutting down and turning in on ourselves, right? So Melanie has put together these wonderful self-reflection and lifelong learning questions and says, you know, courageously, we have to ask these questions. We have to ask these questions when we're in, when we're preparing ourselves to work with clients and with colleagues. And so again, you're going to get this slide deck and I really want to invite everybody to start that cultural humility journal and start writing, reflecting, be in conversation with a trusted peer, your equity partner. How do I think about, and think about this with your with your team, for example, these are the people we're in service of. How do I think about this cultural group? How do I, what stories am I making up about this cultural group? Do I, how do I know that that's true? What are my biases? Like we have to really go there, right? What is that based on? So these are some really powerful self-reflection questions that expand our knowing of self and allow us to reconnect in different ways with other folks. And I think that these are great questions to do individually and to do collectively, again, with your team. In your handout, you have this, ha you have this picture. It, it, um, I'm sorry, in your packet, you have this handout. And I want to tell you about kind of this deep, the way, the reason why I always spend so much time on principle one, number one, is because it really is the foundation. It's the most important. The more we know ourselves and how we show up really matters, right? And so this activity, I really love. And I always joke and say, this is what I looked like before I had two children, but everybody's different. And so I don't want anyone to get stuck on the idea. They look at this and go, that's not what my body looks like. It doesn't even, have, you can put a circle with like four lines coming out of the circle, whatever works for you. The idea is to quickly, without judgment or with like self-editing to just write down sources of identity. So one source of identity in the circle, which could be the head, and then a source of identity on each arm and on each leg. Or again, if you did like a circle, like a sun with like lines coming out of it. And the, the identity that I want to encourage you to put in the head is the one that's not most important, but the one that is informing you the most right now. The one that when you're making decisions is the identity that pops up for you. What I'm going to put in that circle is that I'm a mom. And what I might include on some of these others, I mentioned I'm a biracial black woman. So my racial identity um, and there's both the, the aspects of both our what and our who, you know, I'm, I love reading. I love drinking tea. I'm a tea drinker. Um, I'm queer identified. I'm a cancer survivor. So, you know, there's lots of different identities that I might add to, to this visual, but the one that I feel like right now in this moment and identity changes, so it'll change over time that I'm putting in the head is mom. Um, that's a cultural identity that I feel is always in the foreground. I'm always thinking about my kids, right? So um, I'm thinking about them during this presentation. How are they doing? Are they, did they get their homework in? I hope their day is going okay. It's always in the foreground for me. And it's a cultural group. I remember when I was pregnant with my son, I didn't even realize I had entered a new cultural group until I, I think I was in an elevator and the, there was a person on the elevator who touched my belly and said, what are we having? And I was like, we have been having it. Wait a minute. We've been having anything. You know? <laughs> or I can remember being in a grocery store and um, a woman coming up to me and asking me if I had considered like my, um, my breastfeeding options. And I'm like, what is happening? I was here to get a watermelon and now I'm discussing dairy with a stranger. Like it was just very interesting experiences. I had no idea that I had entered this whole new cultural group. 
And um, I had my son right around the same time as a very dear friend of mine. Um, and every Friday, once we started going back to work, because um, we had some time off, she we would talk on the phone and she would call me on Fridays and say, girl, I'm on my way to go get my hair done and my nails done. It's me time this afternoon. And every Friday, I would find myself becoming more and more irritated with this phone call because I grew up in a culture where it's once you have your kid, there's no, nothing else matters. The child is the priority. There is, if you eat that day, good for you. If you got some sleep, don't brag about it. Like the most important thing is that child. And so I found myself getting like more um, like judgmental. And I thought, Veronica, what's going on with you? Like, where is this coming from? You know, you have to talk about this with your friend. And so we got together and we were talking and I said, it is just pushing all my hot buttons every Friday when I hear you going for your self-care time or your, your me time. She called it my me time. And I'm like, what's going on with that? Like, I never heard about me time. And she goes, oh, well, my mom taught me that to be a really good mom, you have to take care of yourself. And so I've integrated self-care time. And I think it was probably the first time I'd ever even heard the words. I'm like, what is this self-care time you speak of? What is that? Like, I'd never even heard of self-care. And so she was like, oh no, you have to take care of yourself. It allows me to show up better and not be so frustrated. And it was at that moment that I realized it's not that I was doing mothering right and she was wrong or she was wrong and I was right. It was that we got very different messages about what it was to be a mom. And we got very different messages about how to show up. And so again, not right, wrong, good, bad, but just different. And so I realized that the way that she takes care of herself, you know, is to go to have, um, get her hair done or get her nails done or something like that. And, and the way that I take care of myself is, um, I talk about her, no, I'm just kidding, <laughs> but, um, you know, that she knows I tell this story, but I learned that we take care of ourselves in very different ways. And the other thing that I learned from that is that I had internalized this cultural message that I should be selfless. That was the cultural message I got growing up about what it was to be a quote unquote good mom is that I would be selfless. But sometimes that shows up in not always really positive ways. There are things about that that I love, about generosity of spirit, about being really expansive, about wanting to um, always be there for my kids. And then sometimes it shows up like dysfunctional rescuing. And it not only shows up like that with my kids, it shows up like that at work. So with my clients, I've had clients come and ask for help. And then I find myself doing it for them versus providing them with the information they need so that they can learn how to navigate that system for themselves. And it wasn't until I had a client actually say, oh, when I was asking you how to navigate this, they were doing a search for something online and they were using like a shared computer when they were asking how to do it. I sat down and started doing it for them. And they said, oh no, I didn't want you to do it for me. I want to learn how to do it myself. Can you show me? And so I had leaned into this dysfunctional rescuing, taking away their agency versus just making sure again, in the spirit of equity, that they have the tools and resources to bake their own pie. And so this is the kind of deep self-reflection I want for you to engage in around that handout. What are some of your cultural identity groups? What's one that really feels prominent for you right now? And then what are some of the messages you learned about being a member of that cultural group? And how does it show up in your behavior? And in some ways, the very thing that is positive in some environments may play out to be harmful or negative in others. Um, so this isn't like a gotcha. I'm not trying to have you do this activity and feel bad about yourself. Like all these behaviors look really negative, Veronica. I just want you to get a sense of that kind of deep level of reflection. What is my identity? What are my identities? What messages did I receive about being a member of these identity groups? And how does that play out in my behavior at work and in my personal life? Is this making sense for folks? Okay, great. I also want to note that um, Ava asked if she could uh, respond to Cecilia as well. So yes, of um, course. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, absolutely. So Ava, I'm not sure if if um, you're here. I, that was a couple minutes ago. So 
I just wanted to open up that space in case. Thank you. She's still there. Ava, how do you unmute? Uh, you I just invited you to unmute. There you go. I think you're unmuted, Ava. If you're talking though, I can't hear you. Can hmm. I'm not sure. You can also feel free to drop it in the chat. Sure. If you wanna if you wanna write the reflection in the chat as well, we can we can can read it for the group if it's if your um audio is not working. Yeah, definitely. Why I don't want Ava to feel okay. Hmm. It was all positive messages. That's great. So maybe some of those micro affirmations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's keep, if you can help me with keeping an eye. Um, Oh, Ava, thank you so much. I'm sorry that that's not, maybe we can play around with it when we get to Q&A and see if we can figure out mute on that. Thank you so much. So um, I'm watching, oh my goodness, time is going, huh? So let's, let's do, we'll run through these others. So that's one activity that's in the handout for you to continue reflecting on and, and looking at. Um, the next one here, the other principle that we want to review is developing the mutual beneficial relationships, right? Really learning from each other's cultural differences, finding common ground is essential to this. And what you'll see here is, you know, we want to make sure we're being client centered. That's part of the way we can engage in this work. So we talked about that relationship building. So can we hold our client um, as experts of their own experience? and really avoid thinking about it through this kind of cultural competency lens of cultural traits that we're trying to click off and say, okay, I know exactly who this person is. So I'm gonna give them what they need versus leaning into really deep, um, empathetic and curious listening. Let me first understand your story, right? It's kind of going beyond the golden rule, that idea of treating others the way that you would wanna be treated and moving into the platinum rule which states I want to treat others the way they want to be treated. Well, how do I know how someone wants to be treated? I have to ask them. So we get curious, right? And we want to hear each other's stories. Um, and we want to always be applying that intersectional lens. This is a complicated human being. They're not one thing. There are so many different identities and so many different ways of knowing and moving through the world. Can I hold that? And can I appreciate that in myself and know that that's all showing up right now? So here is a self-reflection question. Again, um, a, a possible journal prompt. What are you already doing well and what can you keep doing more of in the way you're connecting with clients and really seeing the whole client? So, you know, a, a, an opportunity to continue to reflect on that. And then also when we're engaged with our clients around interviewing, motivational interviewing, care, harm reduction, all these different strategies for meeting that other person where they are, um, are we working also to reduce our own isms, our own biases, right? Holding them as rich experts, thinking about our work as facilitators and guides. Um, and how do we offer, how do we open more of that up to make sure that the resources and the knowledge and the services that we're providing are really going to meet the needs of everyone who's coming through our agency doors, right? And this is so important because it means we have to hear from those we're in service of. So making sure that there is advocacy, that there are um, informational opportunities such as focus groups, or that you're building um, an advisory council that we're hearing on a regular basis from those we're in service of. 
And this is more than just, well, we did an annual survey or I spoke with one person, but really robust that there is representation on all different levels that we're getting that input and we're constantly in a feedback loop with those we're in service of to make sure that what we're offering is actually what you need and that we are able to meet your needs in a culturally responsive way. Yeah. And so part of the way that we do this is through that process of dialogue that I talked about is one of the skills we want to really work to develop and refine. This is only about a minute, but it summarizes the intention and the invitation around dialogue. So here, let me just go ahead and play this. Dialogue is an invitation for a new way of being and communicating with each other one that does not argue or seek to be right, but one that brings the intention of listening and understanding, where we can uncover our assumptions and biases without judgment, where we can be in a space of inclusion and non-hierarchy, where we are all able to be seen, heard, and appreciated. We live in a world of increased judgment, division, and anger towards each other, Dialogue allows us to create a space of curiosity and openness, where we can acknowledge that we don't have all the answers, that we live in an uncertain world. Dialogue is something creative. By sharing our experiences, we can create meaning together and allow new thinking to emerge. We open ourselves up to the possibility of change. Change cannot be imposed. It needs to be created with people. We achieve this through the process of dialogue. All right. So yeah, something that we think is so important in this work, really being in that place of dialogue. And so when you receive this, and I think it's also in the handouts, it just kind of summarizes a little bit of what we just heard there. Um, about what is dialogue and what it is not, and to just have an opportunity to review this and think about the ways that you can practice more intentionally being in the spirit of dialogue, right? These are some more questions. They're very similar to the ones that I shared earlier. But as we're in our dialogue, being able to explore these questions with each other, with our teams, and also thinking about them through the process of your own journaling um, is so important because again, you're the agent of change, you're the service provider. And so leading with that intention and asking these questions is so important. Um, Oh, we're sorry. I don't know where the slide is going in the wrong direction here. The last one, the, the second to last one here is principle three, the redressing power and privilege. This, I always like this visual. There's this big elephant sitting here and it says, I'm usually right, you know, I'm right here in the room and no one even acknowledges me, which is kind of this idea of power. And when you have the slide deck, it does give a review of this distinction. Um, between power and privilege. And again, we're really looking at the right use of power, again, power with, so that we're not um, you positioning ourselves over as expert and minimizing the experience um, or, allow, or, or creating an environment where someone feels less than um, or disempowered in, in any way. And so this just gives a little bit of a summary of this distinction be between power and privilege and an activity that you can do. So there's a little activity for each principle that I've dropped into the slide deck for you to think about. And so this asks you to think about the places in your life where you have power, where you feel that you have um, social and cultural power. Excuse me. So it may be around your racial identity. It may be about your religion. It may be around age. There are lots of different places where we can say, oh, hey, you know what? I know, um, for example, if someone is a cis male, I gen um, gendered identified person, that they might say, I understand as a man and someone who is perceived and seen as a man walking through the world, I have certain doors that are open for me. I have certain privilege 
I have a certain degree of power to speak and be heard and seen. Um, so maybe you find yourself closer to the inside of this circle versus outside of the circle, where in other places that person might say, but my first language isn't English. And so sometimes because of my accent or because um, of how people perceive me as being someone who had a different home language growing up, I see myself as being outside of the circle, that there's bias that a lot of people have about, about my language. Um, and that's going to be different in different social locations. So you may go somewhere where someone you're in a different community or in a different cultural group where the idea of having multiple languages is highly valued, giving you more power and privilege. So again, it changes. So situating yourself within the United States, within the agency that you work at, inviting you to think about what are the aspects of my identity that give me power and privilege? And where are the places that I feel disempowered and marginalized? And part of the reason we do this is not to make anyone feel bad, but to know that there are places that you can affect change, that the places you have more power and privilege are places that you can be an ally, that you can be in solidarity to someone in that same identity group who is um, being marginalized, right? So within the identity group of age, I'm a middle-aged woman. I know around this age, I have less power and privilege in many ways than um, my youthful kids, you know? And what does that mean? And how can they support me? And how can I support them as we're navigating the world around age difference and age bias? Um, and the way that I might be expecting, uh, experiencing age, especially as it's connected to my disabilities. Um, so thinking about those aspects and how we can be in solidarity, right? So there's some really great reflection questions here as well. So thinking about the role of power and privilege in your life. And then last, institutional consistency. Really wanting to understand that institutions, as it says here, are fairly stable social agreements, but we as individuals can change those systems and can have effect on those systems. And there has to be institutional consistency around cultural humility. So it's not enough for us as practitioners to do the work and the institution to say, okay, that's good. We're not gonna do any changing. But for the institution itself to say, are there ways that inequities have been baked into the system that we need to shift and do something different? So everybody who's using our services or working at this agency experiences the full breadth and depth of equity. And how does cultural humility help us move in that direction? Right. And so it starts here with a few ideas, some recommendations as we're thinking about and positioning this in terms of client service work. Right. So how do we begin to stop the particular cultural, social, political practices that reinforce discrimination in access, services and treatment, whether it's in the healthcare or the social service or education or whatever um, particular organizational system you're working in or discipline? Um, how do we begin to do that? What kind of questions can we begin to ask versus really working to expedite trust in relationships and building power influences where folks feel that they have access and voice? Right. Here are some other examples of tips that inst what institutions can do. Community representation, making sure that everyone has voice reflecting on the human resources practices around hiring, pay, status, um, treatment across the board, um, paying attention to small instances of power. How is power being misused? How is it creating silence, silos? How are some folks being lifted up? Um, is the bottom line trumping love, health, and healing? What are the motivational factors in your organization? So it asks us to really think about these in a, in a different way. Um, in a different way that allows for transformation, right? And so I'm mindful of time. There are um, There is an activity here, again, that I would encourage you to try on with your colleagues uh, to have an opportunity to start to think about your cultural identity and the way that it's influencing positively or negatively, right? Strength, growth, um, your role. And what are the ways that these principles can help 
in your work with clients, being more mindful of self, seeing the person you're in service of as a, as a wise expert of their own experience and a teacher, thinking about how does power get used or misused in those interactions that can really interrupt a healthy relationship with you and the person you're in service of or with your colleagues? And then how can the institution do better to be able to have those conversations? So this today was a review of these four core principles, looking a bit at the history, connecting it to this larger goal and hope for equity in our organizations and in our service provision. We took a little deeper dive and looking at each one of these four principles, talking about an activity for practice that you could do to deepen your own awareness and understanding, and that there are some activities and questions that you can do through journaling and discussion with peers. Also, lots of invitations here to continue your practice, not just the activities that you're going to have through this presentation, but encouraging you to find an equity partner, encouraging you to journal, start a cultural humility journal. So lots of ways to think about not just what does all this mean, and how do I make sense of cultural humility versus cultural competency? How does cultural humility help advance equity? But what are things you can do at the individual level and with your colleagues to really leverage and move this work forward? I'm really hoping that this was meaningful information, that there are some things here you might try on that you'll take back to your organization. But before we close, I would love to hear if you have any questions or comments about any of the content, anything we covered today. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, this was great. Thank you. Um, I, I do have one comment. I think I put it on the chat about that slide that says, starts, listen as if, uh, as, the, as, as if the... Let me see if I can... Listen as if the speaker is wise. Right, that right, one. you just passed it. Too forward. Oh, yeah. I just... Yes, here. Um, no, the, it's listen as if the speaker is wise versus listen to the wisdom. This one. Right, that, that, that one. You just jumped again. No, not in this one. Yeah. No. One more, maybe? <laughs> there yeah. we go. So on the top is listen as if the speaker client is wise. That to me, I, I when I read it, I immediately had a reaction. Meaning, do do you asking me to pretend? <laughs> ah. <laughs> as as if, as as if really the client doesn't have the wisdom, but pretend that they do, or they they have. So, just in the way that the language, listen as if, but more like listen to the wisdom in the client. I love to, that. Yes, I love that. I completely hear what you're saying. And I would like the opportunity to change it right now. Because I think that um, this is this is how we learn and grow together, right? I'm learning with you in real time. And um, that hadn't been pointed out to me before, but I definitely hear what you're saying is that it can it can change the meaning. It's changing the meaning of what the intention here is behind that. Um, so, because it's not that we want to listen as if they're, you know, we're just going to pretend that they're wise and that they have gifts, right. but that we're really listening to their wisdom and to believe that um, even when people come to us with deep trauma and maybe they haven't accessed their own wisdom, that we know, right. we believe and understand that it is there. And our job is to hold space in a container for them, for any individual, colleague, client, to tap into those gifts. And so I really appreciate what you're saying. And I'm I'm changing it right now. I love that so much. Thank you. Yeah, it just goes into the narrative of politically correct that doesn't matter you what you think, just act <laughs> one way. But you right. know. Which is definitely no not what is right, exactly. Yeah, and so I def and I I'm so glad you're saying this. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Thank you.
Thank you. Okay, anyone else? I was gonna say maybe while folks are thinking about any other questions or reflections and thoughts, I did want to make an announcement. It's a little bit more on the technical side, but um, this meeting is uh, eligible for continuing education credits. Um, they're being issued by the NYU Silver School of Social Work, and you can earn up to three continuing education credits um, for this session. And so what I've done is actually dropped the link in the chat. And if you are, you know, a, a mental health professional, a social worker, yes, exactly. Any of those credits, um, we can issue them. So if you visit that link, then please um, just register um, at that link and then NYU will reach out to you so that um, they can issue them for, for you. Um, and I believe this here are the details around the type of um, credits that those are for you. Thank you. Um, if it's asking when they expect to graduate, um, is that is it a required? entry, you might be able to just write not applicable. I know that um, before the first time often you have to create an account uh, with them and then must give a year. Uh, maybe you expect to graduate this year after this course. <laughs> um, and that's something that I'll just clarify with Ben who helps us to coordinate them. So. <laughs> you graduated from the course today, perhaps. <laughs> Yay. Okay. And I'll add that if, um, and I can put in here, if you're interested in learning more um, about cultural humility, please, uh, you know, feel free to let me know. Oops. I was going to add my uh, here's my email i'm so passionate about cultural humility i really feel like it's a way of being in the world and just really living our lives um and i'm always excited to share i feel like i spelled that wrong allied path consulting at gmail.com always happy to share resources and tools um, and you can also find the video and a lot more articles on my website so um, I just encourage all of you to try it on keep practicing being in conversation I hope that we'll be able to offer this workshop again and do a deeper dive into each one of the um, principles and really explore those through more activities together and yes, you will definitely receive the slide deck. I like to go back through the slide deck and make sure that there are journal prompts and activities in the speaker notes section. So I'm going to go back through and add a few things based on this presentation today. Um, and then I'll send that to Ainsley, who will send that out to all of you. So please make sure that you check below in the um, speaker notes section for some additional reading or activities and resources. Um, and I hope that 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 will be helpful and you can share and be in conversation uh, with your with your teams. Anyone else? I'm wondering, I'm looking, I didn't check the Q&A. Thanks, great. And um, one thing I'll note as well is that um, if anybody is unable to or needs some sort of um, proof of attendance, but um, doesn't require continuing education credits, they can issue a you know certificate of completion of the course. So um, let me know if you would like one of those, and I can absolutely uh, make sure that you get that. And we'll follow up with everyone via email uh, following. <laughs> 